Hi there, my name is Hugo Harvey. I'm a fifth year thesis student at the University of Auckland studying architecture. This project is titled Embracing Floating and Amphibious Architecture in Tuvalu, looking at floating farms and fales as a response to climate change and sea level rise in vulnerable atoll island nations. So for this project, the brief was actually to form your own brief. Most of the idea was around the ideas of space and time and looking at how we can address events that take place over a very long period of time. An occurrence once a year, or it could be something that's ongoing that could take, say, 100 years, which is the case with this project looking at sea level rise. An almost invisible global occurrence that graduates in increments of only millimetres every year. It may not appear to be an imminent threat, but lowland countries are particularly susceptible to these changes. Through my research, I came to find that almost all of the high-risk countries were island nations, particularly oceanic atolls, such as Tuvalu and Kiribati. There are a number of problems that these atoll islands face, largely related to one habitable land area. Tuvalu, for example, only having 26 square kilometers for their entire population of 11,000 people. The soil is becoming infertile due to saltwater encroachment. So every year, there's an occurrence called a spring tide or a king tide. And when these king tides occur, saltwater encroachment renders the soil infertile. And this is a slow, gradual process, but over time, the soil is becoming unusable. Local crops such as pulaka, taro, coconut are starting to fail. And so these key crops that are maintaining these island nations, this higher way of life, are starting to disappear entirely. And with them, the likelihood of their culture surviving. As you know, Pacifica and Moan cultures excel at making boats, and they have been seafarers for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And so it only made sense for that relationship between Pacifica and Moana cultures and the ocean to be explored and realized fully as a habitable place. In a sense, the ocean for some cultures may be considered a big open vast space that is sort of to be feared or is considered a border, but these Moana cultures, the sea is almost part of the land, in a sense. The feasibility of these farms is possible because atoll nations have an enclosed lagoon, which is sheltered from the outside rougher waves of the island. So even if these banks, these circular sort of banks of land, come under threat from sea level rise, there's still a shallower and relatively calm lagoon that's in the middle. And these lagoons provide a very valuable space of protection for amphibious architecture to survive. So this project was a chance for me to look at what exists what we're able to do with the current technology, and then see where we can push that. Coming up with my forms is that, first and foremost, practicality and function takes precedence. If I'm building an amphibious structure, it needs to be symmetrical enough so that even with a live load, it's not going to tip over. Secondly, wind shear coming from either side of the ocean isn't going to topple the structure which is why I started to look into these more hollow, more porous structures where you'd have wind loads that wouldn't come up against large flat surfaces where it could tip it over. And likewise, the massing is aimed at being more central in the same way that a rudder might be to prevent tipping. Looking at other roof forms, I had to consider harvesting potable water was really important for these communities because the need to rewater soil with fresh water. And so to create a large oversized roof that was able to capture and harvest all of this rainwater. So these roof forms, for example, are all symmetrical, and these are inspired by Pacific broadleaf plants, and they sort of scoop outwards to harvest water. One of the other important things I had to think about was that because this was an event that would unfold over a long period of time, there's the assumption that they could expand. So for example, these boats initially were triangular, and they would fit together like a puzzle piece that could slowly fill up the lagoon. So over time, you'd have a large landmass that's actually entirely artificial that's forming right beside their existing hometown. So it'd be very easy to move things from within the existing infrastructure of Huvalu, integrate them with these new metabolic type structures. So this is an early sketch I did, looking at this profile of a fale structure with a slightly bent roof. If multiple of these farms begin to line up next to each other, you can start to see that there's a wave pattern emerging and in succession or canon, they would look sort of like a moving body of water. So this is the form based on the traditional waka. For this model here, on the top, I've basically superimposed a traditional Polynesian fale. So that relies on this rigid post structure here. You can see there's a central column that goes up the middle, a single beam that goes across the top, and it's supported by two side walls. 
This leaves for a very open central space, which is very important for these Polynesian cultures because it allows people to congregate and come together. But also there's sort of a hierarchy of direction and orientation that sort of unifies everyone. But there's also these auxiliary spaces to the outsides where people are able to mingle and come in and sort of pour us through like the sides. And this prototypical model was looking at traditional Southeast Asian, especially Malaysian construction because they utilize sustainable materials and fast growing materials such as bamboo. And they're the neighboring regional culture to the Pacific Islands. And so it was only made sense to sort of utilize geographical and social answers to these existing questions by looking at what was already there. Now what's important about these Southeast Asian spaces is, is that they have this raised internal space which allows them to be out of dirt, out of water. If there's flooding, for example, it keeps them elevated in a protected space. And that's one of the key ideas that's also important to the central floating farm idea is that you're keeping something elevated. So this is the model in its final conceptual stage. So what the most important things are about the structure is that one, it's made of sustainable materials or things that are sort of recycled from imports. There's a hierarchy of spaces, so you can see down the sides, down the middle, and at either end, there's spaces for circulation. So it's really important that the structure can be accessed from all sides because there'll be boats coming up to the structure. There's an aperture in the middle, which allows for at least 12 hours of sunlight each day for the crops below. And that allows regular staple crops such as lettuce, for example, to grow really fine, but it also provides enough shade during the day that people who are working or using this structure aren't going to be exposed to too much sunlight. And there are places for them to recede into the sides and take a break. So at the sides here as well, you've got these sort of workstations where community members can enter the structure and they can harvest and look after their own crops. And then there's also spaces for them to treat and wash and prepare these crops so that they can take them home or they can share them with their family on the structure itself, and they can sort of use the structure as a place for eating, for dining, for leisure, etc. So here's an exploded axonometric of the design. So you can see how I'm thinking about multiple layers at once. Starting from the base, these are recycled 55 gallon barrels. So these are quite common import export materials for countries with low economic socio status. Quite common, especially like disaster relief, for example, you get lots of barrels of water coming into countries. So this is the essential recycling component of the entire project, which enables all of this floating to occur. So we're looking at the traditional ridge and support structure that I discussed earlier, the ridge and post. In order to strengthen and structure that base, we're looking at a series of galvanized steel trusses, so they're waterproofed using uh, zinc alloys. On top of those, we have the infamous recycling of shipping pallets, and you've seen shipping pallets probably all over the place. That makes up the majority of like the sort of floor system. And then we've got a series of flexible bamboo framing, as well as some coconut wood, which forms this sort of harder structure. And those are in a, in a pattern that is that evokes the shape of a leaf, and there's this big open hollow structure in the middle, which allows the light in. And then in order to create an area for the soil to grow, for the plants to sit on, we're using bamboo. So there's a bamboo lattice that's constructed largely because bamboo is a very fast growing sustainable material. It's very accessible just to the west of Tuvalu in Southeast Asia. And then on top of that, there needs to be a layer of soil or hessian. So basically something to keep the soil from falling through the structure because it needs to be hollow, so it's not too heavy, but it still needs to have that structural integrity. And on top of these outside structures, we've then got a woven thatched roof made of a combination of coconut fibers and plant matter. This is the internal space of the farm. As you can see, there's sort of like a clear central axis here, which is the traditional Pacific way of building. So you have the open fale. It's where you usually have seating areas or pews where we've got the crops. And then there's the large circulation space around the outside, which provides space to complete activities and to treat the plants and the crops. As you can see at the back there, there's a water tank, which is fed to by a, a perimeter trough or gutter that sort of leads out to the back. So any water that's caught on the roof can be maintained in the structure and used for watering the crops. So in this image here, you can actually see how the roof comes together. Here you can see the texture and you can see the materiality of all of these components. And you can see it's obviously coconut coif there, which is the, the fibrous uh, remains of the coconut plant. You can see here there's like this relationship between the edge of the structure and the land. So this sort of forms a threshold between their traditional life or their traditional livelihood and potentially what the future might hold or the opportunities that they might need to take advantage of. Definitely utilizing the accessibility of boats and sort of free flowing use of space in the ocean. So in the making of these structures, I've looked at largely the local materials, which include coconut timber, coconut fibers, shipping pallets, oil drums, water barrels, hessian, which are all byproducts of existing imports, which can be upcycled in the making of the farms. The structure 
embraces specific construction techniques and modular components. That means if storm damage occurs, the vessel can be repaired using traditional arts and crafts such as weaving, thatching, and lashing. And this also encourages socio-spatial relations, so the community is incentivized in some ways to work together because of the scale of the project in order to create these repairs. So there's sort of like an ongoing awareness and it's sort of the responsibility of the whole community to look after and adapt these structures themselves, which is the idea really to increase resilience. So I think it was really important for me for this project to understand the core reasons behind why Moana cultures operate the way they do. And it's not so much just like a surface value, so it's not just pure observation, it's not just, oh, there's a form that they use that I, I should copy because that's how they do it. Yeah, I was trying to get an understanding of how the relationship between these cultures and their environment has traditionally been. So in terms of how they use resources, how they come together to build things. This floating architecture, and in part like a tradition of practice, allows this knowledge to be passed down from generation to generation. While maintaining and protecting their existing cultural identities through the use of traditional arts, crafts, patterns, it also means that there is a sort of evolution of this culture and of this tradition over time. Tradition for tradition's sake is not useful unless you are using it to compare to your current situation. Sure, history is useful, and I don't deny that. But you also have to look at what can you change? What's, what is different now than when that tradition was important? I always like to think that I'm pretty happy with my work. I, like, I wouldn't hand in something if I wasn't happy with it, but time is always the main thing. So I think for everyone, like you should work almost up until the last minute. There's always room for more exploration, more creativity, more answers, more questions even. That's the benefit of conceptual work is that you can keep pushing it. Like I could return to all of these projects and sort of update them and have another go. So I think for the most part, I was pretty happy, maybe a say like an eight out of 10, but I could definitely get up to a 10 with some more work. For this project, I actually really enjoyed firstly the research module because we had to write our own briefs. So I had to really, really engage with problem solving and decision making and figuring out what even I wanted to look at as my issue. And I think that initial stage is really helpful, especially going into thesis because needing to find and manage your own work and on time is very important. I also really enjoyed the model making challenges of this project because I was using some unusual shapes, um, a sort of strange scale, and it required me to really think quite uh, physically about how I was burning something. Like not only did it have to stand up in real life, but also had to be able to tell the story that I was trying to tell through my drawings. And sometimes things like non-linear shapes can be hard to make or manufacture. So everything in this model was handmade and cut by hand, which took many, many hours, but it was like so rewarding and really worth it. And I learned a lot of skills trying to tackle this project. If I was to continue this project, I would probably look at a number of ways that I could have expanded my scheme. So at the, at the current stage, it was looking at what's that prototypical first step in being able to catalyze this type of change in these specific communities. But a really a long-term goal would be to look at how to expand the scheme and look at what other opportunities it could provide to other countries and other environments or sites where this might be beneficial. You're at university to take risks. If you're coming to study architecture, you should make the most of every opportunity. And the best thing to do is to not do what you already know how to do because you don't learn anything. You should always be looking for opportunities to tackle things you've never looked at before or things you're scared of. They're always the things that you learn the most from. Go into them headstrong and see how it goes. Just watch it from a distance and learn from it. It's the best thing to do. And also you can follow me on any of my social media handles, Hugo Harvey. I've got uh, a website, hharvey.work, if you want to see paintings, illustrations, film, and my architecture work. So please hire me. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>